So I want to say just a, a few words of introduction. Um, we're here to celebrate, I guess that's the right word, to celebrate Don Handelman's 80th birthday. And um, although I have a feeling, a strong feeling, that in the course of today, people will have rather a lot to say, mostly pejorative things to say about linear Newtonian time, the fact remains that this number 80 seems to have actually taken place or to be taking place. Although it did cross my mind that it could be that the, this 80th celebration is only another one of those Mobius loops that Handelman goes through from time to time as if he were going through himself in a kind of curving, looping way, and which would mean that perhaps he's been 80 many times, and each time it was some completely singular event <laughs> that only looked like a repetition but was actually entirely unique, like this one. You know. So. Uh, I don't think that I need to introduce Don to this audience. Uh, but aside from saying, uh, there are two things that I want to say. First of all, um, you know, Don Handelby taught for many decades at the Hebrew University. Um, he, arguably the most creative analytical mind that I myself have ever met. Um, very beloved teacher and colleague and interlocutor. Those of you here, and there are many of you who had the privilege of studying with him, so you know, you know what I'm talking about. And this is the second thing I wanted to say. I had the great um, joy and privilege and wonder and amazement of working with Don uh, in two places in India, first in Tirupati, when we worked in the summer season, it was 45 degrees out at midnight and hotter than that during, <laughs> during the day. We were working on the Gangama festival. And then later, in an even more kind of dusty, grimy place called Vijayanagaram at the northern end of Andhra Pradesh, where we were working on this festival, the, bana the banana festival of the goddess Paidi Tali, when something like 500,000 people throw bananas at the goddess who is embodied in a person who's waving in the sky. And I just wanted to say that for me, um, those were life-changing experiences, you know. I'm a philologist, I guess, um, maybe not a very good one, but I'm a kind of a philologist. And we are, we philologists, we're supposed to be very meticulous <laughs> about every little thing in language and text and so on. But actually, I mean, meticulous also can mean boring. But we're supposed to be meticulous, but I learned for the first time what meticulous really means when I was watching Don in those paddy fields where every tiny piece of information, every moment was laden with the possible significance of the totality, and that totality tended to emerge at some mysterious moment late at night, I guess, which we would hear about at breakfast the next day. And I saw how he collected these tiny significant moments and created out of them an entire cosmology, an entire cosmos, piece by piece by piece. It changed my life. So, Don, thank you very much. Glad that we're all of us here today. And because um, we don't have a lot of time for this first session, we have four presentations in this first session. We're going to stop at one o'clock for lunch. So that means each of the four speakers has about 20, 25 minutes. If you want to have some possible um, discussion or questions, some interchange. Uh, and I will try to exercise my authority <laughs> in the course of these next two hours, uh, how shall I say this, um, in a kind of a brutal gentleness. Okay, so Don, it's yours to begin, please. What can I say? I'm, I am what I am, and this is what I was, and uh, maybe I'll be uh, I do want to say uh, that I want to dedicate my words to my beloved friend, Professor Yellow Mizrahi passed away not long ago. And I'm not dedicating them to his memory because he lives very, very deeply. And actually, I'm so pleased 
that he is. So I'm calling this, is time a dynamic force, or is time a passive passage? And my task here is to ask whether anthropology should take for granted that time is a dimension tied to space, whether anthropologists would benefit analytically by treating time in its own right, and whether this might indicate whether time may be a dynamic force rather than a passive passage. And then I want to say some words about a shaman who I met over half a century ago, and who I think lived through different premises of existence than those of my own. But especially because he may have healed with time. A few words about time as the fourth dimension, as a passive uh, passage. Well, from the beginning of modern anthropology, uh, anthropologists have addressed the problem of the existence and shape of time among many peoples around the world. And anthropologists have generally used our own common sense understandings of time as the baseline of comparison among peoples. Uh, between us and other peoples and so forth. Uh, for someone like myself growing up in rural Canada during the 1940s and 1950s, we all took it for granted that time is a movement. The movement is linear, chronological, and divisible. And we all accepted what Einstein said, that there are four dimensions, three of space, one of time. And that time is felt, perceived as subjective, and therefore it is variable even as it is measured objectively and exactly. So the only real time for us was objective and measured, measuring the passages from past to present, and so whether examining whether anything had changed during these intervals. Now this is what I'm calling time as a passive passage. We pass through time, though what we are as human beings is not made or shaped by time as such. We and everything else are shaped by other forces, biological, social, cultural, and we use time to measure and evaluate these forces. So time is a passive passage, a pliant medium through which interaction occurs. But time itself is not accountable for that interaction. The philosopher Elizabeth Grosch, who I recommend everyone should read, calls such time a neutral medium, one in which matter and life are framed rather than as a dynamic force in their frame. Nonetheless, the common sense acceptance of time as linear as the fourth dimension continues to dominate uh, the anthropology of time. It's present in common sense phrasings like the flow of time, time unfolding, both of which are associated with what is called a processual anthropology, in which the idea of process is critical to temporality in anthropological <coughs> analysis. Anthropologists rarely question in their research that time as linear, together with time as a fourth dimension, are a particular cultural social shaping of time rather than a universal absolute baseline with which to compare time among other people, other peoples, to compare them with our own time. So too, they, like ourselves, may well have different subjective experiential realities of time. In this regard, the anthropological understanding of the living of time in other cultures often is categorized as belonging to the subjective realities of those societies rather than to the objective reality of linear time as a medium of passive, uh, of passive passage. 
Yet, if time exists, and if we do not simply assume its linear movement, then, as the biomathematician Plamen Semyonov says, the true nature of time is inequitable, and the true nature of time eludes science and mathematics. And if time exists, and if time is always moving, should we not consider time as dynamic rather than as frozen? as frozen measurable dimension of space, as the physicist Lee Smolin puts this. The philosopher Jean Gesser argues that time is not a dimension, in other words, not a dividing measure, but an a-mention, an element free from division and measurement, a basic phenomenon without spatial character. Perhaps it is the very movement of a-dimensional time that is dynamic in the forming of living. To paraphrase Henri Bergson, I would say time exists to prevent everything from happening at once, and yet to enable everything to happen. In this way, it is time that enables difference to exist and to generate further difference through time. The ways in which time moves seem to be critical to questions of ontology. If there is a multiplicity of cultural ontologies, as there likely is, then perhaps there likely, perhaps time too, is not a singular medium of passive passage. It is always the same, even though it is interpreted differently. Perhaps time itself is a multiplicity. Not a multiplicity of distinctions between objective scientific time and subjective native time, but of temporalities that work differently through the ontological premises of other cultures. In my view, this is the most difficult of questions that an anthropology of time can take up. Moreover, it may be one to which there is no answer. Nonetheless, the question I think must be asked and thought of. Let me say a few words about the Native American shaman Henry Rupert over 50 years and what he did over 50 years ago. Now, I'm mentioning Henry here because at that time, it was 1964, uh, he also changed my life. I had finished a uh, MA in anthropology at McGill University in Montreal. And on my way to begin a doctorate at the University of Pittsburgh, I went to Pittsburgh by way of Nevada. And in Nevada, I met Henry Rupert. And I was one kind of anthropologist going to Nevada, and another kind of anthropologist who went from Nevada to Pittsburgh. So Henry Rupert was called the, a member of the, <coughs> of the Washoe tribe. And the Washoe lived in an area called the Great Basin. The traditional Washoe cosmos was a world continually in movement. This movement was that of, in quotes, power that filled the cosmos. And power had a strong affinity to the life energy of all beings. This was a fluid cosmos. Bergson and later Michel Serre commented that our own metaphysics are those of the solid, of the very thingness of the solid, and of movement between times of rest and times of stability. So movement is clearly distinguished from the solid. On the other hand, the fluidity of the Washoe cosmos was associated strongly with the fluidity of water, while power was intrinsically attracted to water, and power flowed along the waterways. This was a living cosmos, and all of its elements and beings were strongly interacted. Or, as I, I have argued elsewhere, they were intraacted. In Henry's reality, all beings, all flora and fauna, required water in order to live. Water flowed with life, 
life flowed with water. Water was the duration of life. To which I extrapolate the following, that water was time. If the duration of water was disrupted, then life fell ill. Duration was disrupted when life was dried out, life energy failed, and so forth. This often occurred when a person inadvertently failed to provide water to the life force of another organic entity, whether human or not, for which the person was responsible. In response, the dried out entity took the water it needed from the person responsible, desiccating this person and making this person ill. To put this a little differently, life faltered when its own time, its water, was taken from it. Henry's healing solution was often to ensure that water, and so time, would return to both of the afflicted. Henry worked with entropy. This is to say that he healed with time. The reduction of water in an organic being increased its entropy and reduced the duration of its internal time. Without the ongoing movement of time, the condition of the afflicted became increasingly indeterminate. Healing involved restoring the life force of the person by replenishing water, by replenishing the person's internal time. In order to heal these conditions, Henry had to make the ill person self-reflexive about his responsibility for the condition of illness. Self-reflexivity is a turning into oneself, a returning to a previous time when the person was actually making the error of desiccating another being. So here self-reflexivity has the potential to become an act of renewal. The physicist Ilya Prigozhin argued that the time of the universe is linear and that it is this very linearity that results in time that is open-ended and indeterminate, with futures unknown. For if time curves, then correcting the past becomes possible, and so the future may become deterministic. This possibility Prigozhin rejected. But he argued that with the increase of entropy, the time of the universe moved into conditions of far from equilibrium, and that under these conditions, the linearity of time became variable. Moreover, he insisted that life is possible only in a non-equilibrium universe. The emergence and evolution of organic life is not possible in a determinate physical universe. We live in conditions far from equilibrium. Organic life always exists through conditions that are far from equilibrium. Conditions far from equilibrium enable the reproduction of organic life forms. Organic reproduction is the movement of time that is negentropic, interning reflexively, moving back into dynamics that will re-energize and recreate the organism. Yet during this temporal movement of interning towards repetition, the organism continues to move forward in time as a linear progression. This suggests that there is always a time lag, a gap, a desynchronization between the progression of physical time and the reflexive regeneration that is organic time. And it may be that this gap opens to the potentiality for change in the organism from generation to generation. Now, I've suggested that in Henry Rupert's healing, the replenishment of life energy and the replenishment of time were one and the same. But, I ask, was time here simply malleable, simply passive, to be manipulated by the healer? Or was time dynamic, enabling or even making something happen in the healing process? Let me note another ethnographic detail here. The first spirit helper that Henry acquired was that of water itself. In 
In Henry's healing, he would pray to water for the well-being of the patient, asking that the aggrieved being, dried out and dying, agree to stop dehydrating the patient in return for receiving water from the patient. The time that is water acted to help replenish the time duration of the patient's life. Here, time was hardly a neutral passage that healer and patient passed through. Time was life-giving. Indeed, time in itself was a force, as it may be in the reproduction of the uh, organic. Initially, when Henry became a shaman, he did traditional washroom healing, which required working for three consecutive nights, uh, from dusk to midnight, and then a fourth night from dusk until the dawn of the following day. Uh, this ritual had a rhythmic pulsation, night after night, uh, intensifying, intensifying, until in the dawn of the fourth day, the shaman would have a vision giving a better idea of whether uh, the victim agreed to stop dehydrating the patient. Later on, he acquired a second spirit helper, a young Hindu, whose skeleton stood in the local high school. Uh, and although Henry continued to do traditional healing, he began to see himself as a skeleton, during while he was healing, as a skeleton wearing a turban and moving quickly around to the body of the patient. Henry's own being during ritual had changed. Uh, he had introduced the potential for speedier time, his own interior velocity speeded up with the augmentation of life energy that the Hindu brought it. Many years later, when he was about 70, he healed a Hawaiian cure, and uh, in return, the Hawaiian gifted Henry with a third spirit helper <coughs> named George, <coughs> who lived in a Hawaiian volcano. <coughs> now, Henry brought uh, George brought Henry new healing techniques, together with the maxims that everything comes quick and goes away quick, and we help nature, and nature does the rest. And what happens then is that for ailments that were easier to cure, Henry did away with visions of diagnosis, prognosis, his chanting, many other elements. Healing now would take between 10 minutes and 4 hours involved praying to George and putting his hands on the patient to remove pain. The rhythm of pulsation and repetition largely uh, disappears. Uh, Washo cosmology and the energy of time as water were largely uh, done away with. The person uh, himself, herself, was depersonalized since there was no need to establish causation through errors of omission and uh, commission. Though the emphasis on speed and velocity, or through the emphasis on speed and velocity, time came more fully to the forefront as the dynamic that enabled a wide view. Now, the increase of speed in Hawaiian view deterritorialized time, and non pulse time became more the dynamic of movement. Moreover, Henry gave little or no regard to the patient as subject. He wasn't interested in the cause of pain, errors made by the patient, and so forth. In Henry's world, time was not a passive passage, but an active force. The message seems clear. Change time, and you change the dynamic of time. And without changing time, there is no change in the dynamic of time. Once, when we were talking about his shamanism, he told me unequivocally, what is real for me is not real for you. I was not surprised, yet nonetheless I was nonplussed. What was the significance of this statement? It did not single out one of our realities as objective and true, and the other as subjective and, if not untrue, then misguided or deluded. He seemed to be telling me that we lived in different worlds, but differences that were not simply the result of different interpretations, 
of the same world. And that different worlds did exist and moved through themselves differently. We live different ontologies, different cosmologies. I live time more as the fourth dimension, time more as a passive passage. He often lived time as Gebser's a dimensional time, as a force for dynamic movement. Do we live on an earth of multiple ontologies? Probably we do. And is the movement of time a major force in this multiplicity? I think that likely it is. Perhaps without ontologies of time, there is no ontology. Thank you. I think we can take maybe five or six minutes. Somebody has a pointed question or a non-pointed question, because the whole point of today is to open up a kind of space or scope for experimentation and speculation. Such things that was Don's intent and request, and I think we are happy to be able to go with it. So, let's see if there is some response. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I said, I, I think recently something that's quite very inspirational for me. Uh, to, your, to the next book. And I was wondering, just on the ontology, on the ontology point, why not? Why not? Uh, in a central argument, it seems to me there's a single ontology. And that, there are, that what is talked about is multiple ontologies are different insights that different peoples produce on what is an essential <coughs> common to all. And that this is the anthropological point. That no single body of knowledge uh, is complete in relationship to how it may understand the universe and so on. Uh, and that everybody has an insight on what is universal. And that you're actually moving towards a universal understanding. That's why you're interested in Einstein and people. And that the, the, the sense that there's something which is which is time, process and so on, which underlies us all, that we're all motivated in that. And what we understand as time uh, in our reflections and so on, uh, or what some people call ontology. They're not ontologies, they're in a sense reflections on ontology which is already universal before. You're pushing to make that. No? Okay. Nice. My understanding, a singular ontology would be an open-ended ontology in the sense of it is full of potential. And so the different understandings, insights, as you call them, would be developments of, extrapolations of that potentiality. So Einstein, at least the earlier Einstein, the later Einstein, seems to have had all kinds of doubts. Certainly some of them put in his head by, uh, by the mathematician uh, Kurt Goodell. Uh, Roy Wagner says that in, in later life, uh, Einstein basically came into the office uh, to talk to Goodell. <laughs> so potentiality, the potential. Yeah, there's something powerful uh, in that uh, in that idea uh, because it also make, it makes the question of ontology, uh, I think, unanswerable. Uh, but then from another angle, it should not be answered. I mean, every, every closure that is accomplished <coughs> by a person or a group uh, and so forth is, in a sense, a diminishment uh, of that potential. Uh, and then the future lies in, if there is a future for us, uh, somehow opening that up and uh, not being trapped within this, as uh, Khaled was here somewhere, mm. there you are, 
as uh, Khaled argues, uh, and I also argue. So, I mean, that, this is my sense of it. But I, then I'd add to that, uh, there is something important in Deleuze here, that Deleuze uh, contributes to this. Uh, but Prigozhin, to me, uh, if I understand correctly, and I, my mathematical capacities are profoundly constricted, there's no potential whatsoever <laughs> in my capacity to understand that. So I may have him wrong. But nonetheless, if I have him at least a bit right, in the right, in, the, in, 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 in a direction, in a fruitful direction, then he laid it out for me. So look, you can only have organic existence under conditions far from equilibrium. Now, conditions are far from equilibrium, open potential. This is, this is uh, critical. 